Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for showing up. Um, well, as you know, um, this guest lecture is organized by Pine, um, short for Pluralism Economics um, Maastricht. Um, we exist um, since 2014 already, and we aim to um, foster a debate about um, plurality in economics, because um, contrary to what you might learn in university, there isn't only one um, wide theory um, on how things are, but there are actually a variety of um, viewpoints and we want to um, yeah, um, introduce them to you. Uh, we organize guest lectures as today, but also workshops um, or reading circles um, and also whatever you feel like you want to organize. Um, so in a sense, Pine is also what you want to make it because we think um, economics needs to become um, more diverse. And today we will um, talk about the uh, housing crisis, which unfortunately many of us, um, um, like many of us feel their effects, unfortunately. And uh, while today um, um, Josh Ryan Collins will um, introduce us to the bigger picture, uh, we will also hold a workshop in two weeks where we focus on um, the local housing crisis here in Maastricht. Um, and we will uh, send a sign up link in the chat in case you're interested to, to join and find solutions together with us on how we as a city could um, tackle the problem. Yeah, and now I give, um, yeah, it on to you, Jan. Thank you, Hannah. So um, yeah, today with us is uh, Josh Ryan Collins. Uh, he is a, a senior research fellow uh, in economics and finance at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And uh, his main research uh, topics are credit and land and housing and how all these things relate. And he is also kind of a pluralist. So uh, his uh, uh, research is very cross uh, disciplinary. He combines a lot of schools like um, uh, disciplines like macroeconomics, economic history, sociology, but also political economy. And he draws uh, from different economic schools like uh, post-Keynesian institutional or evolutionary theories. So I think for, for this alone, he fits very much uh, in this context of uh, our initiative for pluralism in economics. And uh, yeah, so today he will uh, speak about Housing, he has also uh, published extensively on it. For example, uh, the, the book uh, Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing, which he co-authored uh, together with uh, Toby Lloyd and uh, Laurie McFarlane, and uh, which was also um, um, included in the Financial Times uh, Top 12 Economics Books uh, of 2017. So, uh, this is pretty impressive. And uh, also, uh, more recently, he published the book, uh, Why Can't You Afford a Home, which will also be uh, the topic of this lecture. And so without further ado, I would uh, yeah, uh, give the floor to you, Josh. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you, Jan. And um, well done for creating Pine Maastricht. I'm always very happy to um, see so many <clears throat> pluralist economics societies springing up around the world and uh, very happy to speak to, to students who uh, appreciate the need for different perspectives on some of these big problems that we have. So welcome everyone, thanks for joining me. I'm going to talk, uh, as Jan said, about the economics of housing and um, zoom in on different explanations for why house prices are, are so high relative to, to our incomes. Um, and in particular, I will focus my talk on the concepts of, of land and finance and money and credit more specifically, really, um, which essentially are the two areas of uh, economics that I've become, that are, that are my research focus, they're, they're two uh, topics that have been very neglected in uh, mainstream economic theory and neoclassical economics, certainly. Um, but they're topics that have become uh, m much more significant and important, in particular, since the financial crisis of 2008, um, including in macroeconomics, which is which is my main field of, of study. Um, 
So I will share some slides with you just to um, to guide you through my ideas. Uh, there we go. That working fine, Jan? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, well, I've, I've called the, the 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 talk. Why can't you afford a home? After my, um, I found a nice little picture of some some Maastricht housing there as well. I've never actually been to Maastricht, which um, I think I, maybe I went when I was very young with my dad actually, but um, I can't remember anything about it. Anyway, those houses look um, look quite nice, but um, I suspect they're they're well out of the uh, range of any of of you students. But um, anyway, there you go. Um, one day I'll make it over to see you. Um, as Jan mentioned, I've written a couple of books on this topic, um, which are, which I'll focus on. Um, the, uh, the the orange book there, Why Can't You Afford a Home, is um, is quite a short, easy read. Um, the other one's a bit a bit more a bit longer and heavier. Um, and then um, you can also find quite a, 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 a good summary of my main thesis of what I'm going to talk about today in this article, which you can download for free, um, called Breaking the ha Housing Finance Cycle um, in the journal um, Environment and Planning A, space for sort of economic geography journal. Um, now, what I'm going to focus on, as I said, is this sort of paradox of ever rising house prices, um, which, is, which has been a paradox for a long time, actually. Um, uh, but the last sort of 18 months of the COVID-19 pandemic have, have sort of raised the, the, the paradox to even uh, higher levels of, um, of puzzlement, I suppose, because the, the COVID pandemic saw this enormous collapse in people's incomes, in economic activity, in purchasing power, um, uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the biggest recession the biggest economic shock really uh, ever to Western economies, or at least in, in living memory. I mean, there's some, uh, some data that shows that in the UK case, it was the biggest economic shock since the, um, I think since the Great Plague in the 17th century. Um, so sort of four or 500 years, basically. Um, yet what happened to house prices? they um, just carried on going up. In fact, they increased. Um, the rate of growth in house prices increased during the pandemic period. Um, as you can see in this chart, uh, in these two charts, uh, the one on the left showing a couple, of, um, a couple of advanced economies, you can see the sort of upturn um, over the last year. And then the US, um, that US chart just shows you um, that this increase uh, was um, the case across all different types of housing. Now that's interesting because one of the thesis, theses about what's driven rising house prices during the pandemic is the sort of race for space that people, um, that people basically, people living in cities decided if they were gonna be working at home a lot more then they would, they would use any savings they have to buy a bigger property um, or move out of the city. Um, but what this chart interestingly shows you is um, that uh, actually densely populated areas saw higher house prices um, than uh, more sparsely populated areas. Um, so um, it, it, that, that in the US case, anyway, that doesn't quite seem to be the case. So, you know, a real puzzle there. How do you have rising house prices when it comes to falling so fast? If we go back in history to the 1970s, when you, you know, first start getting decent quality data on, on house prices, um, this, this data is from the OECD's analytical house price. Um, it's freely available online. Um, what I've done here is I've plotted the house price to income ratio averaged across, I think it's yeah, 16 uh, OECD economies. Um, and plotted it against the long run average, which is the black line where, so it's plotted against 100, which is the long run average. It's a standardized house price to income uh, and a ratio there. And what you can see there is there was some evidence of a kind of um, equilibrium in this measure, which is the sort of standard measure of affordability for housing. Um, you know, it's a bit of volatility, but there's some, some evidence of, of some sort of equilibrium. 
until you get to the late 1990s, when you have this enormous increase in house prices relative to incomes, the, the housing boom that led up to the financial crisis of 2008. And then you have a sharp fall. But what's interesting is, is that fall doesn't bring that house price to income ratio back towards its long run average. It picks up again um, from about 2012, 2013. And of course, recently we've seen it rise even above the peak of the 2008 crisis, again, on average across um, high income economies. So um, something's, something's changed, it would appear, something fundamental's changed, it would appear in this, in this relationship between house price to income. Um, now, if we look at the Netherlands, um, you can see it sort of vaguely follows the average, but there was a but sort of got, got on um, on sort of hyper hyper drugs from the 1990s, really steep rises in house prices um, uh, up to the crisis, uh, and then a, a kind of sharper fall post crisis. Um, but again, picking up um, uh, more recently. So um, no, nothing that odd about the Dutch experience relative to the average, except a slightly more rapid rapid increase. Um, it, one of the interesting consequences of rising house prices relative to incomes, it's a rather obvious one, is that it, it's led to a fall in the levels of home ownership in some of the major um, advanced economies. And interestingly, the biggest falls have actually been in those economies, the Anglo-Saxon economies, where the concept of home ownership is politically strongest or culturally strongest as you, as you know the we anglo-saxons are very attached to our to owning homes it's sort of a key element of our concept of, of capitalism the home owning democracy margaret thatcher's famous phrase but actually we've seen house price uh, levels of home ownership falling from a peak of around 70 percent in the sort of um, early 2000s down to closer to on average 65 percent more recently, and that and that pattern's continued. The, the data, if you map it up to more recent times, continues. And of course, this is averaged across all age groups. But if you looked at, um, you know, the under 35s, for example, uh, you'd see a much bigger drop off in the levels of, of home ownership. As many of you will be aware, it's now almost impossible to buy buy a house under if you're under the age of, of 35 in many cities in Europe. <clears throat> so clear kind of political as well as economic challenge um, presented by this rising house prices. Um, now, what, how do we explain this? You know, what, what is the, the explanation? So one of the explanations, one of the most popular explanations um, out there is, uh, and this is the dominant explanation in policy, I would say, in, in some, some parts of, um, in, in some schools of economics, probably the more mainstream schools, uh, is that it's a supply problem. We, we're just not building enough homes uh, to meet the demand from um, increasing populations, uh, increasing levels of immigration. Um, and um, uh, this is, this is uh, you know, there's, there's just simply too much demand relative to supply, uh, too much demand for housing as a place to live, essentially, from, um, from, from growing populations. <clears throat> um, now, if you believe that's to be the case, if you believe we're simply not building enough physical properties for people to live in, i.e. to use housing as a, as a consumption good, um, one would also expect that um, the uh, rents would be rising um, relative to incomes. Um, but in fact, that's not the case. Uh, in fact, rents have broadly tracked incomes again on average lots of diversity rents in big cities tend to go up faster than in in other parts of, of, of the country um, but but broadly rents and and, and incomes have, have have demonstrated a relationship over time which is why in this chart you can see i've i've plotted both the house price to income ratio the previous chart you saw and the house price to rent ratio and you can see that actually the house price to rent ratio has um, exploded at an even faster rate since the 1990s than the house price to income ratio. Um, now, this would suggest that 
that explanation that this is fundamentally a lack of supply of homes for you know as places to live for people um, doesn't give doesn't provide the answer to this puzzle of rising house prices to income um, because there's clearly a, a, a difference. Um, some something's going on here, which um, which means uh, that that rents are not increasing at the rate one would expect. <clears throat> now. The supply side explanation also isn't very good at explaining one of the most important dynamics we've seen in housing markets, certainly since the um, since the 1980s, um, which is its volatility and the tendency to have these cycles of boom bust in house prices. So this, this sort of boom bust um, peaks and troughs. <clears throat> Um, which um, you know the UK is probably one of the worst examples of. Uh, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's I don't, I'm not sure if the Netherlands had had such a big uh, boom and bust in the late 1980s as, as the UK. Anyway, um, what I've plotted here is real house prices in Ireland and Spain, um, which some of you may be aware of had some of the biggest bubble house price bubbles in history um, in the run up to the financial crisis of 2008. You can see their house prices um, uh, uh, increasing five times um, in that period, um, and um, you can you can see there both economies experienced enormous collapses in house prices as well post crisis. Um, so you might think that you know these countries were not building enough homes. If you were a supply sider, um, probably they're building less homes than other countries in Europe, which, um, did, uh, which did not experience this boom bust, this, this huge bubble. Um, but if you look at the data on the completion of new homes, uh, you actually see the opposite. You see that Ireland and Spain um, were building, uh, at, at running up to the peak of the crisis, were building many, many, many more uh, properties, more houses than um, every other European country, essentially, in fact, over double the number. So they were building more, yet prices were still increasing at this incredibly rapid rate. So again, the supply side argument doesn't seem to explain this, this puzzle. Now, the answer to the puzzle, I believe, um, it lies in, in a better understanding of the role of land and the role of finance in the housing market. And that's where I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture uh, talking through. Um, so on land, <clears throat> um, what you find if you disaggregate um, or if, if you track the, the price of land separately from the price of housing, and you need to understand house prices as a um, as made up of the, the, the cost of the structure, the physical building and the land underneath it. So, so, so a, a house price is a composite measure of, of the land underneath the house and, and the the bricks and the mortar and the labor involved in building the, the house. <clears throat> um, and what you can see here is um, in the US case that up to the 1990s, there's, you know, there's evidence of a relationship between land values and, and house prices. But up to uh, but fr from the 1990s onwards, you have this explosion in land values, land prices um, that they're going up much faster than the price of, of, of actually building structures. Um, and the same sort of pattern you can see in the UK. So it's land that seems to be driving this. It's changing in land values that seems to, rather than changes in the cost of building houses, the bricks and mortar and the labour, that seems to be driving this. And in fact, there's some, some very good research um, by some German economists, um, Schulerich and Christina Knoll, which show that around 80% of the increase in house prices since the 1950s in advanced economies can be explained by rising land values um, rather than um, the cost of housing, building housing itself. <clears throat> so land's, land's the, the key ingredient here, but what's driving land, land values is the question. <clears throat> and my answer to that is, you know, there are a number of factors, but the key factor the elephant in the room here is finance. It's the role of, of finance and credit, um, bank credit in particular. Um, now, um, what you need to understand about land and finance is they are um, 
well, as I said, commodities that are very poorly understood or neglected in economic theory. But they're also commodities that have quite opposite properties. Um, and these, the fact that they sort of have these opposite properties, almost like a magnet um, and a fridge, they sort of, it means they attract each other. <clears throat> so if you think about those properties, land is highly um, inelastic in supply. Um, now, when I say land, what I'm really talking about is location, the location of house in through space and time, essentially. I'm not talking about like physical quality of land, earth, grass, or whatever it might be. I'm talking in, in an economic sense, land needs to be thought of as location. Now, um, you can't create new location, right? Uh, a spot of land that's next to a good school or next to a, a nice park or on the on the river in in Maastricht on the sea in Maastricht um, you can't just recreate that in exactly the same space each each location is by definition unique um, whereas um, so it's highly inelastic you can't just create more desirable locations it's just impossible they wouldn't be desirable um, credit and money on the other hand is highly elastic you know banks create money in the act of, of lending and um, this is a key insight of post-Keynesian economics, of course. Um, and um, the decision to create that money is basically determined by their confidence, as well as to some extent by, by regulation. Um, so um, that's one contrast between these commodities. Um, what about mobility? Land is fixed and immobile. You can't move it around. Uh, you can't hide it as well. Um, which is why something should be taxed more, in my view. Credit and money is highly mobile. We know international capital flows. It moves around the world. Land, because of these properties of being limited in supply and immobile, tends to appreciate with economic growth. It tends to absorb the surplus created by economic growth um, in the form of, of rent. And, and essentially what rent is, and I'll talk about it in more depth, is when you're essentially controlling a scarce asset um, that, that is needed for production and you're receiving profits in excess of the effort required to maintain that, uh, maintain that factor in production. That's, that's one definition. So if you're sitting on a piece of land um, in a city and the city's growing, the value of the land underneath your, your house is going to go up. Um, and you can capture that land value in, in a number of ways, which I'll, which I'll talk about. For the same reason, it's a, it's a very attractive source of collateral for banks. Banks will always be happier to lend to you if you're a small business, if you're happy to put up your house in return, because they know because it's, uh, that they can capture your, your, that land. It's the land rather than the building they're interested in, um, and that, that, that will keep, keep its value over time, unlike other forms of collateral. Um, so um, that's why banks love, love making doing mortgage loans. Um, in contrast, money itself, credit, um, will depreciate over time with inflation. So um, this is why um, when, when inflation is you know, creeping up as it is at the moment, property tends to become more attractive uh, to investors because um, they know that um, uh, just keeping money in the bank, especially when there's low interest rates, will um, lead to losing value over time. Now, land also has, and this is very important, conflicting economic uses. If we think about um, property, domestic property, housing, as I said, housing is a consumption good, and uh, we talked about that already, but it's also a financial asset. It's a store of wealth. If you buy a house, you're also making an investment in your using your money, putting it into an asset, which, as I said, tends to increase in value over time. Credit and money um, can also have different impacts on the economy. Um, and this chart sort of captures that, uh, captures that dynamic. One can think about two circuits of bank credit. Um, and, and finance more generally to some extent. And th this is a key insight of Joseph Schumpeter. And, um, and uh, in case you're, you're not familiar with the historical uh, links, historical origins of this kind of distinction, Keynes talked about it as well. Um, 
in much of his work, certainly his earlier work before the general theory. And so one can think about a sort of positive, productive flow of credit where a bank makes a loan to a business, that business um, invests that money in new capital equipment, in you know, some new innovative service. Um, the effect of this is to increase GDP transactions because the economy is becoming more efficient or you know, productivity is increasing. With greater productivity, you have higher wages. Um, with higher wages, people consume more. This creates more demand for goods and services. Businesses then want to expand. They borrow more from the bank, more productive credit. And the additional money that's created by the bank is absorbed into the economy without having inflationary effects. Then one can have sustainable growth because the business can afford to um, pay back the principal and uh, the interest because of the, the growth that you've seen in GDP. So I mean, I'm simplifying massively here, but that's the basic concept. In contrast, bank credit that flows into property or existing assets more generally, but I'll focus on land here, um, it just tends to basically, given that given the finite supply of land and property, it inevitably tends to inflate the price of that land and, and, and as a result inflates the price of houses, housing. Um, now, what this does is it actually increases um, the debt burden because everyone now needs more money to buy uh, housing. And so they borrow more, um, but you're not creating that increase in GDP transactions or that increase in productivity. Rising house prices makes no difference at all to the product productive capacity of the economy. Okay, it's, it can be thought of as just a sort of overhead burden on the economy, it's just making everyone's life more miserable because everyone has to pay more debt or if, you, if rents are going up, you have to pay more rent, obviously. Um, and what that means is actually re it reduces demand in the economy, reduces aggregate demand, and it re thus reduces the profits of, of firms and reduces their investment because they're, they're earning less and there's less demand. And so they tend to have even less demand for productive credit, whilst the demand for asset-based credit is going up um, as house prices rise. Um, so um, that's that's the key sort of distinction, and that's why the role of banks is so important in understanding rising house prices. So my basic thesis, I'm not the only one with this thesis, but you know my, my, my basic argument over the last um, five years has been that, yeah, mortgage credit is the key explanation for rising house prices. And the reason for that is the deregulation of mortgage credit in the, in the late 80s and early 1990s. Um, the UK was the first, the UK and the US, the first to, to sort of deregulate their financial markets and encourage banks into the mortgage business. Before the 1980s, banks basically weren't in the domestic mortgage business. Um, this was a cartel run by um, uh, cooperative um, banks or building societies, savings and loans companies in the United States. And you'll have the equivalent in in Europe as well, mutual mutual uh, mortgage banks, um, and they they were allowed to make loans at much lower interest rates. They had very conservative lending models, so they tended to to only give you a loan if you had a lot of savings over many years or you had a, a big deposit. All of this was um, liberalised, and the whole market was liberalised in the 1980s, and big banks were allowed to compete with um, building societies for um, provision of mortgage credit. And they ran into mortgage lending and mortgage lending started to increase very rapidly, in particular from the 1990s, late 1990s. You can see that here, the blue line is mortgage credit. Um, the, the orange line is non-mortgage credit, which includes consumer credit, but it's mainly business credit. It's mainly lending to firms. That's sort of more productive form of credit I was talking about. And you can see mortgage lending overtaking business lending from the, the mid-1990s. And I've also plotted on the right-hand chart there, the right-hand axis, uh, real, house, real, ha real house prices. And you can see that close relationship between rising mortgage credit and real house prices there. So that's the, that's the sort of central thesis. And this just shows you the period 
the most intense period of mortgage market deregulation and innovation. Um, one of the key innovations was the development in the late 1990s of mortgage back, residential mortgage-backed securitization. And this is a process by which um, banks, rather than just making money from um, the interest rate differential between the interest they pay on deposits and the interest they charge on mortgage loans, started to make money from making lots of different loans, packaging them up and into securities, loans of different risks, and selling them on to institutional investors, into, into capital markets. Um, and this, um, this, this was a key culprit in terms of the financial crisis of 2008. Um, at the same time, liberalization was also enabling banks to fund themselves in different ways. So they were getting funding from wholesale markets and, and shorter term finance, not just from deposits, domestic deposits, really, which are the safest form of financing for banks. And um, when the value of, of, of uh, many of, of houses started to fall in the financial crisis, the providers of the short-term finance to banks suddenly got very worried the banks wouldn't be able to repay their loans and started to pull out, pull that liquidity out of the banking system. And this was the primary cause of the financial crisis, um, certainly in the UK and US, which then spread throughout the, the whole world. Um, so one might have thought post that experience that the European Union would not be supportive of, of mortgage-backed securitization, but in fact, it has been extremely supportive. The, the European Central Bank has played a key role in, um, in uh, getting the, the securitization market back on course and ensuring that it's functioning. This chart just shows a much longer term picture of uh, house prices and mortgage credit and of rising. Uh, mortgage credit and rising house prices. Um, this, all of this data is from the Jordan Schuler Taylor Macro History Database, which I can really recommend to you if you're interested in um, long run historical macroeconomic time series like, like this. Um, of course, the other development that's played an important role in all of this is in, real interest rates have been steadily falling um, since, the, since the 1990s again, or in fact, even since the 1980s go back further. Um, now, this is an important in explaining that differential between the fact that rents have not changed that much, um, but um, asset house prices have. Um, it obviously makes borrowing much cheaper if interest rates are lower, and that makes buying a house um, much a much more attractive proposition relative to holding your money in some other form of safe asset, such as government bonds, for example. So um, the blue blue here is the US 10-year government bond rate, and the gray line is the world long-run interest rate. Of course, inflation has also been falling. Um, that's now changing, it seems. So interest rates may also pick up. So this, path, this, this dynamic may be about to change. Anyway, um, Clearly, lower interest rates uh, have been a factor. Now, when you have uh, the opportunity um, to buy land, um, this gives the opportunity to own and, and, and generate these economic rents I was talking about before. Um, and this, is a, this was understood hundreds of years ago by the classical economists. This is a quote from Adam Smith. As soon as the land of any country has become private property, the landlords, uh, like all other men, love to reap what they never sowed and demand a rent for its natural produce. Um, and I'm going to sort of move on now to how we deal with this problem of rising house prices and the financialization of housing. But I wanted to make the point, really, that the classical economists recognized this problem many, many hundreds of years ago, um, and they proposed, actually, some of them proposed to tax uh, these land rents, so to tax the rising value of, of land um, uh, uh, the, to socialise those rents. Others, like Marx, proposed to just nationalise land and prude off. Um, but what we've seen, um, the other factor, I suppose, in driving up the demand for housing as a financial asset 
has been actually the decline in the taxation of property, um, which has been going on for, for a long time, even before the deregulation of the financial system. Since the 1960s, certainly in the US and the UK, we've seen declining relative um, property taxes relative to other forms of tax. So this just shows the US case. Um, the US, you saw a shift, um, certainly since the Second World War, of tax away from property and onto income, onto consumption, VAT, cars, um, which, which um, uh, uh, but the same pattern can be seen. As soon as home ownership essentially became the majority tenure, you started seeing a lot of political pressure to reduce taxes on property. But of course, that meant that people could capture more of those, those land rents. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, just skip forward a bit, because I want to get onto the, the alternatives and the solutions. Um, but this chart just sort of tries to summarise the dynamics I've been talking about. Um, uh, we have this, this combination of different dynamics. You have low interest rates, you have financial deregulation and innovation which means you have this expanding residential mortgage-backed securities, um, bank credit and capital markets becoming more linked together, new sources of funding for banks, um, an increasing shift towards lending against mortgages, which are more attractive because they're the best sort of collateral, rising house prices, rents being captured um, as taxes fall, less subsidies on the demands on the, on the supply side as well, um, more, more, de more demand side subsidies um, and a weakening non-market housing offer. That's the other part of the story is that governments moved out of the provision of public housing um, and, um, and uh, started to instead subsidise um, subsidize, uh, mortgages. Um, and um, so, yeah, that, 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 these dynamics are sort of non-linear. They're, they're, and again, that's why you know, linear models of the economy or general equilibrium models of the economy are not very good at explaining what's going on with house prices because all these, these dynamics are reinforcing. So I talk about um, housing finance feedback cycle. Um, and, you know, the key question is how do you, how do you break through this? Um, and this idea that housing is now primarily being valued as a, a financial asset rather than a consumption good is also borne out by the dynamics in cities that you've seen since the financial crisis, where there's been this huge rush, this wall of, of liquidity flowing into um, housing, real estate in the world's global cities. Um, and those cities have sort of, the prices of, of property and land in these cities have synchronized away from their hinterlands. So, you know, London, Berlin, Hong Kong, Amsterdam is probably in that category as well. The prices there have shot, shot away from the prices in the rest of, of the country. Now, solutions. Where are things different? Um, <clears throat> well, you'll be pleased to hear there are some exceptions to these, this sort of iron law of the, of the housing finance feedback cycle. And these are those countries. Um, uh, Korea is one. Germany, uh, at least <clears throat> until maybe the last five years, you could say, was another one. Um, house prices in Germany relative to incomes actually fell from the 1990s up to um, very recently. Um, uh, and, the, and then I've split the Anglo-Saxon average there just as a comparator. So, so what was going on in these countries? Well, one explanation is they have different bank structures. The actual institutional structure of their banking systems is different. They, in Germany, they actually have banks which de-risk their loans not from um, demanding property as a form of collateral, um, but by developing relationships with the firms um, that they lend to over time, deep relationships um, for over many, many years, where you know the boss of the, you know, the manager of the business is on the board of the bank and vice versa. A bit nepotist, you know, it's a bit insular, one could argue. But essentially, um, these this kind of relationship banking enables you to de-risk your de-risk your loans by um, but without demanding property. And that means there's less money flowing into property. It means as a business, um, you can get a loan without um, putting up your house as, as collateral. Um, so in Germany, around about 60% of banks are either cooperatively owned or they are local, lo um, local public banks, um, Sparkas and Landers Bank or cooperative banks. And these banks um, mainly lend to businesses. They had a, 
they didn't suffer the kind of collapse in the financial crisis. The Landers Bank did to some extent, but they were quite resistant to that, that boom bust scenario. Um, and they have these different kinds of, of structures. Um, they're not focused on 10% returns. In the UK, in the US, and many other high income economies, the dominant model of bank is this, is this shareholder bank, which does require this higher return, um, is focused on short term returns. And because they're much bigger, they don't want to make small loans to businesses. They want to make big loans for mortgages um, or, or in some cases to, to the financial sector. Um, so that's one that's one explanation. And here, this chart just shows you um, that the, compares the UK with dominated by these mortgage oriented shareholder banks versus Germany, where you have these these uh, smaller locally owned or cooperatively owned banks. Um, you can see um, the colours are not quite right there, but um, the lending to non financial corporations is around about fifty percent of GDP in Germany. It's only about 10 to 20 percent in the UK, whereas mortgage lending in the UK, so the red line, is much much higher than than in Germany. Um, so that's a, a one factor. Of course, Germany also has um, one of the world's largest state-owned investment banks, the KfW, um, which again uh, doesn't make doesn't do mortgage loans. It does loans um, for physical infrastructure. It's played a huge role in Germany's. Uh, green transition, you know, subsidizing loans by the local banks, for example, for people putting solar panels on roofs or insulating their homes. We've got no equivalent of that sort of bank in the UK. Um, and one of the first and most successful of these state investment banks was the Bank Centrale du Crédit Immobilier et Industriel in France, um, which essentially financed the building of the railroads across Europe um, in the 18th century. And what's interesting about this is the term credit mobilier. What we have today is banks that practice credit immobilier. Uh, they essentially mainly do real estate. Um, and, and that's the opposite of what we need. We need, we need banks to be funding infrastructure, transport um, and industry rather than real estate. So that's one sort of structural institutional things that are, are, of the banking sector is, is really important, but financial policy can also play an important role. As you probably know, if you're interested in central banks, central banks, you know, they, they target their interest rate policy, targets consumer prices, not asset prices. So house prices are not taken into account um, in their measure of inflation, which means they've sort of benignly just let house prices shoot up over the last um, 30, 40 years. That could change, that needs to change, I would argue. Um, we have had macro prudential policy where banks target the flows of credit to different areas of the economy and have repressed some mortgage credit, um, but it's not been sufficient um, to stop the growth in house prices, as, as I've explained. Um, what I think we should be considering is a return to the more quantitative credit guidance that was widespread um, in the 1940 to 1970s period in many advanced economies, um, especially in Southeast Asia, it was used as well um, throughout the 70s and 80s and in China. And this is where the central bank simply tells commercial banks, you know, you, you can only loan up to 10% of your loans, you know, can go to this sector of the economy that we don't like, we think is speculative or, or at risk, creates financial stability risks. 60% um, of your loans have to fund productive activities um, or have to fund manufacturing or have to fund export oriented industries or have to fund green, um, green energy investments. Um, this was normal. This was normal practice. It's totally foreign, the idea to us now, but it was normal practice in that, in that Keynesian period from the 40s to the 70s. Um, you can see here the New, New Zealand of the first central bank to include house prices in its rate setting policy. So, and they have raised interest rates faster than almost any other country, I believe. <clears throat> so that's what you can do on the sort of finance side. But, but you can also do pol policy that tries to capture those land rents that I was talking about. Um, so you can use planning tools, um, infrastructure levies, for example. Um, to capture the uplift in value that comes from investment, particularly if you're 
if you're opening a new rail link, for example, or making some other major infrastructure investment, um, you you build into the property to force the property developers to pay some money, you retain a portion of that value value uplift as a public sector organisation in the area. This is much easier, of course, if you own the land, which in Holland um, some some areas I know do own quite a lot of the land still, and you can use that money to 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 reinvest and, and carry on like this. Um, but there are a range of other um, land value capture tools, including taxation, of course. Um, and just owning the land, as I said, can, can be very important. Um, and um, I've just listed the sort of land banking, public land banking, where, again, the, the public sector owns a, a, a large amount of, of land. Um, and the OECD's re recently done quite a nice paper um, report on these different types of land value capture. Land value tax, annual increase on the incremental increase in the unimproved land value so if you put in a new kitchen in your house, you're not going to be taxed on the fact you've got a nicer kitchen. You're just being taxed on the increase in the land value. Very easy to calculate these days if you have insurance on your on your property. The you know the value of when you're asked to type in um, stuff about that, that, what they're doing is they're insuring you. You'll you'll notice that the the amount that they insure you for is always less than the market value of the house because it's just going to replace the physical structure. Not the land, because the land, as I said, is it can't be damaged, it can't be um, rid, got rid of. Um, how do you introduce it without massive political resistance? Not easy, because uh, the, the politicians that run our country tend to own a lot of land. <laughs> they don't want to change the system. But one way to do it is to make it tax neutral. So get rid of income tax or other unpopular taxes and replace them with, with a land value tax. As I said, public ownership captures the land rents, socializes the land rents automatically. Um, so in many sense, it's, it's the least politically, you know, least politically problematic policy. But of course, if your land's already privately owned, it's difficult to do. Um, but so there's no economic evidence that private home ownership, private landed home ownership uh, is a better, is a better tenure system for economic growth. In fact, the opposite tends to be the case. People are less mobile if everyone's owning their, owns their home less likely to move to get better jobs. So it reduces labor mobility. Um, now, some countries like Singapore, the state owned 90% of the land. And of course, Singapore is one of the most productive economies in the world. Um, and what it does is it leases out uh, land for private or public developments um, and uh, but keeps hold of the land and then charges taxes on, on the use of the land. South Korea has a very large land corporation that essentially controls residential and commercial development. Um, <clears throat> other options, community land trusts and cooperative housing models, um, which are, uh, are quite popular in some parts of Europe. This is where you separate the cost of land from the cost of housing. And um, this enables you again to capture the, the land rent so that the, the trust is held by the community they will, they will, if you join the, if you get a house in the community, you'll, you'll only pay, you know, the cost for, for renting the, the house, not the land, but the increase in the value of the land. And when you sell your, you get a lease, effectively, if you sell your lease, usually they link the cost of renting to local incomes rather than it being determined by the land value. Um, so there's, a, there's a good example of that in, in Brussels. One of the challenges is getting the land in the first place is quite difficult, especially when local authorities um, uh, are, are struggling for for money um, and I think I'll leave it there because I want to have some time for questions but in summary land and housing have these unique properties which have been neglected by mainstream economists um, a deregulated land market will tend towards monopoly um, you know playing the game of monopoly is a really good insight into the economics of, of land um, a small number of people just tend to end up with everything if you don't have policy interventions. And if you have a deregulated financial sector on top of that, um, especially with, with low interest rates, this will tend to, um, this will tend to, you, you'll get banks um, moving towards real estate inevitably because of the value of the collateral, the size of the loans, which pushes up prices. Um, and of course, the financial sector also captures those land rents through the interest rates they charge. 
Um, so, you know, we need to shape these markets. We need to shape the land market and the financial sector um, for more productive economies and to prevent um, the housing affordability crisis that we have today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very uh, yeah, captivating uh, presentation. So we uh, like to yeah, still have a, a few questions. So um, if you do have a question, please uh, raise your hand and then I can unmute yourself. Uh, and uh, also, you, uh, if you don't want to be on the tape and still want to ask a question, you can still do so. And then uh, you can send me a message and we'll cut you out. So this is also no problem. So I see, uh, see a question from uh, Kem already. So I will ask to, you can now unmute yourself and ask the question, Kem. Um, thank you, Jen. Um, so I know a lot of your research um, circling around land and credit. Um, so do you think it would... Uh, the housing price itself can become an indicator for a recession coming in the same way that you have an inverted yield curve or the decline of private debt in the economy. Yeah, yeah that's my question. Do, do I think that falling house prices it should be an indicator of recession? Is that a question? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, yes, basically, yeah. I mean, when you have an economy where house prices are so central to um, growth. Um, you know, one thing I didn't talk about really was, of course, rising house prices in a liberalized financial system means you can withdraw. Um, you can make equity, home equity withdrawal. You can basically borrow against the rising value of your home to fund, you know, consumption or putting a new kitchen or holidays. And that's been a key source of consumption demand in uh Anglo-Saxon economies, um, and so yeah, falling house prices will reduce that level of will reduce consumption, um, and it will probably lead, almost certainly lead to banks reducing their lending to, in general, but specifically to small businesses who are seen as the most risky lenders because the banks are worried about the value of their collateral falling, and about the risk of people not repaying their loans. So you can very swiftly. Um, can very swiftly be in recession. But temporary falls in house prices, of course, um, are normal. Uh, it's when you have more sustained falls that you need to worry. Alex? Yeah, so Alex, uh, you can now unmute yourself. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much for your very insightful talk. Um, and I'm not an economist, but anyways, um, the point, uh, the question I would like to ask you is, um, what role do you see potential uh, municipalities could play when it comes to leasing housing as a um, yeah, as a solution? And lease, to lease to the effects of banks and credit banking. So I didn't quite understand that. Did you say leasing housing? Yes, thank you. Sorry. What I meant was um, uh, when the municipality becomes, um, or let's say next to the municipality, you also have like institutions such as the university, in the case of Maastricht, actually, if we can take a specific one, which could take um, position in the real estate market mm. and where the municipality could potentially finance this under a lease act um that you don't buy the land, but you only buy the building on top of it. Mm -hmm. And that basically the banks become, an, uh, well, the municipality could become a re the real estate banker for the people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with that mm, specific model that you're, you're talking about. Um, but I said, perhaps what you're talking about is, is this sort of model where universities um buy up property and then um and then their staff or students can can rent in those properties at reduced rates relative to market rates um and perhaps what you're saying is the university could use the fact that it's quite a big landowner to get you know reasonably good borrowing terms from the 
from the bank. Um, so yeah, in theory, I guess it could work. But you would you would want a, a bank giving you a, a decent rate. Okay, next. Okay, Oscar, you can unmute yourself. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually recently graduated from UCM and I'm now working at an uh, urban design firm and I'm designing, building whole new neighborhoods in the Netherlands. And right. I have quite limited knowledge in a way, but I'm still doing it anyways. And I really want to, because my, my, my company is quite sort of traditional and a bit neoliberal, I have to say. Um, uh, not too keen on, on being socially relevant. Um, but I still have a lot of freedom. So I'm wondering if there's any things you would say in, in urban design and urban planning you can like directly implement in uh, designs also in terms of pro program uh, that could <laughs> you know, help the current uh, situation. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's too far out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what, what I would encourage you to do, I guess, is, um, is think about in, when you're designing, um, you know, domestic, domestic property is, is just, just think about the, um, the, you know, tenure, for example, and the role you know of affordable you know affordable if, if you have some influence over the role of um of of demand really you know can you can you build domestic properties that are going to be valued as places to live and not as financial assets really that's the key um that's the key objective um so you know building family homes rather than two bed luxury flats if that's possible for you <laughs> um would be the way forward but probably those decisions are determined more by the by the local authorities i guess or the, or the, the councils that you're working with thank you okay then uh, the last question uh from julia please uh you can now unmute. hi julia Hi, um, I had a question whether you could talk a bit more about um, the influence of the pandemic on rent prices, if that has changed anything, because I assume people want to have a nice home, therefore, you know, are willing to spend more on rent and at the same time, maybe distance to their employment area is less important because they can do home office. Yeah, the, the, there is some evidence of of that in the UK, I think, um, <clears throat> of rents rising um, faster outside the cities, and more demand for, for for rental property outside the cities. Rent, rents in London, I think, have uh, fell actually for a certain part of the pandemic. I think they're sort of picking up again now. Um, but yeah, there, there was certainly evidence that people were uh, leaving London leaving the city um, because they realized they could work at home and live in a much nicer place. Um, so certainly um, more evidence of that. Um, whether that's necessarily a bad thing in the long run, not sure. I think it would, you know, it will balance itself out. Um, there'll be a bit of a return to the cities as people will realize they don't like sitting at home all day on their own. <laughs> um, so I'm a bit less worried about that than, um, than than what's going on with the with the, with house prices themselves, um, which I think is is, is more of a, a major issue. But I'm aware if you're a young person, it's a you know it's a total nightmare because uh, you know the, so much of your salaries is are going into to rents in in, in, in the big cities. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, already nine, so uh, we have to stop here. Um, yeah, Josh, thank you very much uh, for coming. And uh, it was a, a big pleasure for us. And um, also thank you everyone in the audience for coming. Um,
we're having an open meeting uh, for new Pine members uh, next week, Tuesday, if you're interested in that. So we're always looking for new members. And uh, yeah, th thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you uh, next time, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.